welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. One last thing before we dive into today's episode. If you'd prefer an ad-free experience and would also like early access to new episodes, I just wanted to let you know that you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Okay, let's go. Today, it's really great to have Shelly Archambault on the podcast. Archambault is one of high tech's first female African-American CEOs and has a track record of of accomplishments building brands, high performance teams, and organizations. Archambault currently serves on the boards of Verizon, Nordstrom, Roper Technologies, and Okta. She is also a strategic advisor to Forbes Ignite and the president of Arizona State University and serves on the board of two national nonprofits, Catalyst and Braven. She's the author of the book Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms. Shelly, so excited to chat with you today. Well, thank you. I've been looking forward to it, Scott. I've been looking forward to it, too. (laughs) It's very exciting. You're a very interesting human being. You said, as an African-American woman in my 50s, I don't exactly fit the prototype for a tech industry business leader. That's really super interesting. Why why is that? Mm, Because if you look around, you don't find many people that look like me and from my background actually leading tech companies. That's why I said that. So... Why is that? The question is where the why is. Why is that the case? <laughs> uh, or, or why did I make this statement? You said you don't exactly fit the prototype. And so tell me like what the prototype is. And that must have been quite t- t- a lot of chutzpah, as my grandma would say, to really believe in yourself and, and have that unapologetic ambition, right? Yes, a lot of belief in myself and frankly, a lot of cheerleaders around me to help me <laughs> do that. Because trust me, it's not easy. When you say, what does that profile look like? You know, typically, especially Silicon Valley startups, so many of the CEOs come with a tech background. I've been in technology, but I'm a sales marketing go-to-market person. You don't see many people of color that are actually leading those firms. And with regards to women, you don't find a lot of women either. The good news is there's a lot more now than there was when I first came on board. I remember when Kleiner Perkins hired me to run their portfolio company, and I went to the first CEO event. You know, annually they bring CEOs together, content, really training, development, et cetera. And I looked around, and it's like, okay, you know, I'm seeing a good mix of people until they separated the CEOs from the spouses. And the spouses went off to do some things, and we went off to do some things. And I went, OMG, not only am I the only black person here, but there's only one other woman. That's running a company. Wow. Yes. That's really quite striking. Yes, it was. So hence the statement. (laughs) As a shy, gangly black girl in all white elementary school. So being kind of uh, the minority is not new. It's kind of like, you know, your whole life. And you felt like an outsider. Oh, for sure. For sure. I felt like an outsider. And, you know, it almost it almost seemed like people wanted to make sure I, I felt that way. You know, because not only was it that kind of environment, but the t- period of history, this was the 60s. And in the 60s, you had a lot going on with regards to civil rights, actually a lot going on in general, Vietnam War, you know, women's rights, somebody was mad about something in the 60s. So as many people that wanted civil rights, you had just as many that didn't. And people made it known very clearly, you know, verbally, physically, the whole bit that they didn't really want me around. So I knew if I just did what everybody else did, I probably wasn't going to get much in life. Would you say there's, there was like a core aspect of your personality growing up that ha- was a certain, certain tenacity? You know, not everyone has that. Like, where did that come from? You know, so I think it started with competitiveness. I was one of four children. My parents had four kids in less than five years. So as a result, we grew up very close, but also very competitive. So that competitive nature, you know, wanting to win, wanting to get the attention, wanting to, you know, that all that happens when there are a whole bunch of you clamoring all at the same time. So that helped. I think the other thing that helped is my parents, you know, my parents 
really tried to give us some tools to be able to manage all this. And at the time, it didn't feel like tools. <laughs> but as I grew older, it was. You know, you come home as a kid, something happens, somebody's not treating you right, or you should have gotten an opportunity and you didn't, whatever it is, you come home and you complain, it's not fair, right? This happened, that happened. it's not fair. And instead of, you know, my parents saying, oh, you're right, it's not fair, that's a shame, blah, 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 blah. No, no, it was, you're right. It's not fair. Life isn't fair. It's like, what? Life's supposed to be fair. I mean, as a kid, right? Everybody gets even, everybody's supposed to be fair. No, my parents were like, no, no, it's not fair. Don't even look for it. It's not fair. So what are you going to do about it? You know, was the, was really the message. It's not fair. So you've got to decide what you're going to do about it. Um, so I think that lesson combined with the, oh, combined with them telling us that it doesn't, you know, you can't affect or impact what people say to you or people do to you, but you can control how you respond to what people do to you. So all of those things were helpful tools, if you will, as I as I move forward. Because I realized it's bottom line, it's up to me. And you know, the best way to win back to being competitive was don't let people control my emotions. If they control my emotions, then they won. If they make me feel bad about myself, if they, you know, make me insecure or less confident or what have you, then they've won. So don't let them win. You can't control what they say or do, but you can control how you respond. I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors, Helix Sleep. Are you not able to sleep lately because of stress and anxiety? It's definitely understandable given the current state of the world. Psychological research shows that high quality sleep is so important for stress and well-being, and your choice of mattress really can matter a lot. In the past few years, I've been on a search for the perfect mattress, and let me tell you, I've gone through so many mattresses. I had no idea what it feels like to be well rested until I tried a Helix mattress. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses right here in America and ships them straight to your door with free no contact delivery, free returns, and a 100 night sleep trial. To choose a mattress, Helix made a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. If you like a mattress that's really soft or firm, you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or you sleep really hot, with Helix there's a specific mattress for each and everybody's unique taste. I took the quiz and I was matched with the Helix Sunset Lux because I wanted something that felt soft and I sleep mostly on my side at night. I've gotta say I love my Helix mattress. I wake up with zero back pain and zero neck pain, which happened to me a lot before. I wake up really feeling refreshed and ready to work out or start my work. I really do love Helix, but you don't have to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. Just go to helixsleep.com psychology, take their two minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you probably will. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com psychology. Get up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash psychology. That's helixsleep.com slash psychology. Okay, sleep well, and let's get back to the show. You have such a great, your head on your shoulders, as they say, you know, I feel like maybe you're, you're, you were raised right. You know, maybe that's a big, a big part of it is, is the family, the importance of, a, of parents that can communicate those sort of messages to, to a child. But you know, a lot of ways your mother was like a psychologist, all those things that are like straight out of like the cognitive behavioral therapy technique workbook on how to cope with life. And you're on the psychology podcast, you're teaching our audience. <laughs> if you were to ask my mother during those times, and this she told me later, she would tell people that she considered herself a professional parent. That was her profession. And so she read a lot. She did a lot. And she he really tried. So, you know, you, you said in your book, like people keep asking you, how do, how did I get here? How did I get here? 
you said, look, ambition got me here. Okay. Like ambition supported by the conscious choices I made every step of the way. There's sort of like this tension. They kind of treat like a false dichotomy. Like you either on the right and you believe in agency or you're on the left and you believe in it's all environmental fault, you know, for everything. And I don't know, there's something about your whole being that is so refreshing in this climate that is so polarized and has created what what I definitely think is a false dichotomy, you know, that like you're what you can't simultaneously try to fix structural inequalities while believing you have agency too. Like to me, I, I, I'm always trying to think of ways of, of transcending these false dichotomies. And I feel like we're on a, we're on a very similar wavelength in, in that regard. Would you, would you agree? I fully agree. It, it, it's and not or. Right. Yeah. It seems like it. It, to- it totally is. It totally is. And I'm trying to work our way up here. So you created a life plan in college that would ultimately serve you for three decades, right? For the next three decades. Wow. Well, what a, yeah, what a enterprising young woman. <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about, about this. Yeah. Well, you know, Scott, back to, I knew I couldn't do just what everybody else did. And I, therefore I had to figure out how to improve my odds because I knew the odds weren't in my favor. And what had proven to work for me is if I set my sights on something and then really focused on, all right, now how do I make it happen? What do I need to do? And then actually went and did it. Odds were I actually achieved it. And so I was like, okay, you know, this is how it should work. So literally the question I would ask myself is what is it I want? And I decided young, I wanted to run a company. I wanted to be a CEO. And so I said, all right, what has to be true, right? What has to be true for me to be a CEO? And the answering the question, what has to be true is basically doing the research and the homework, I call it. Right. So understand how did people get there? What were their paths? What were their roles? What I mean, all those things, learn as much as I could about what has to be true. And then the next question is, how do I make it true? And it's how do I make it true? That is my plan. That turns into the steps of what I need to do to go make all these elements right that I figured out or that I learned true. And then what I do that I think most people don't, you know, a lot of people will set goals. And some people will put plans in place, but very few people make decisions every day consistent with their plans. And that is what I did. So I was always assuming that the plan was going to happen. Now, it didn't mean it always did, but I assumed the plan was going to happen. And therefore, I made decisions assuming it was going to happen. And that allowed me to improve my luck allowed me to improve the odds that when I actually got to that point, I was, I was ready, right? So in college, they were, at the time, I thought simple things because I said, all right, what are my goals? Well, I want to run a company. Yes. I would also like to get married at some point. I also want kids, right? So those are things I want. All right. So what has to be true? Because all you have to do is look around and the few women that did make leadership roles, and I couldn't find black women at the time, but few women that did, they either didn't have husbands right? Or their husbands weren't working or they were like, I'm like, okay, so what has to be true? Well, I need to find a husband that is supportive of what I actually want to do. Um, and I wanted to get married sooner versus later because I wanted to have kids young if I could. So those were all things I wanted to do. So I just assumed that was going to happen. And I started acting like it when I was 19. I started saving for my wedding that I didn't know I was going to have. So let's, let's talk about some early, you know, we, 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 some of those early lessons in your life. And I thought some of them were, were uh, well, a lot of them were really cool, but we can't, we don't have time to go through all of them, but how about find your cheerleaders? There you go. There's so much in this world, Scott, that, that just tears us down, whether it's overt or very subtle, but we're constantly being judged. We're not, we're not good enough, right? We're not tall enough. We're not young enough. We're not technical enough. We're not whatever it is, right? There are all these things that we're just not quite. And so it's really hard to maintain your confidence, right? And to truly believe in yourself. And therefore, for me, that was absolutely the case because I had so much imposter syndrome. So I needed people around me that were frankly going to build me up because otherwise I don't know that I would be able to fight through. And so my cheerleaders, you know, my first cheerleader were obviously my parents, but my husband became my biggest cheerleader. You know, when things would go poorly or something would happen, he was the first one to, and a cheerleader, by the way, can be a 
you're great, you're wonderful. They could also be a kick you in the pa- pants and I'll get out there, right, kind of person. But you need both. And I think it's really important to have cheerleaders around because it is just so easy to fall into the trap of self-doubt and lack of confidence and all of those things because of how judgmental things are. Uh, so, uh, yes, I believe everybody needs a cheerleader. And I mean cheerleader. Ra, ra, go, Scott, go, Shelly. I mean, somebody who's really there for you. And it can make a huge difference. And the good news is, yes, it was my husband, but it's also I have friends. I have, I still have cheerleaders. And I think everybody needs them. I know I could never do it all by myself. And I'm sure there are a lot of us that can't. You know, very few people have thick enough skin and strong enough inner belief and confidence that can withstand anything that happens in life. Because life is hard. Life is hard. So I'm all about, hey, it's hard. I want as much help as I can get. And a cheerleader is key. So okay, it can change your whole life around. I I was in special ed as a kid and it just took one teacher to just take me aside and she said, you know, what are you what are you doing here? And I was like, well, no one's asked, no no one had asked me that question. <laughs> so it never dawned on me to ask it myself. Yeah, it's just it's it, it's we really underestimate the value of even just one, right? Exactly. Exactly. Teachers played that role for me too growing up. Hi everyone. We recently started hosting the Psychology Podcast on Anchor, and it's been such a delightful experience for us. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Beside it being completely free, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. Also, they make it really easy to make money from your podcast with no minimal listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. This has been super helpful for someone like me, who has so many things to juggle at once and has so much to keep track of. Anchor has been a huge sigh of relief for me. It's really great. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Okay, now back to the show. So you said, like, don't let them win. Who's them? Them is people who are outside of your inner circle. It's anyone who is trying to, frankly, tear you down or not support you, or whatever. So it's the them. It's the ones who want to tear away at your confidence, the ones who are going to exhibit microaggressions, right? The ones who are going to, it's it's the people out there that are actually just the opposite of building you up. But they're the ones that are out there that are actually tearing you down, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And you can't let them win, you know? And they win if they control your emotions. Uh, yeah, and it happens all the time. I mean, when I pick and I get on a board and I can pick, it doesn't matter which one. And pe- I'll get comments like, oh, congratulations. That's great. It's wonderful that they're improving their diversity. Okay. Now you can take that one of two ways. You can take that, that they mean that, okay, you got put on the board because you're a diverse candidate, right? So, you know, only diverse candidates are getting roles right now and all that kind of stuff, which people think and say. So that way you could view it as they're saying something that's actually trying to undermine me, right? Or you can take it as, huh, I reframe it. When I hear things like that, I just reframe it. It's like, hmm, do you really feel so insecure about yourself that you have to make me feel badly about something that I've done? Oh, you poor person. So I just reframe it in my head so that I don't let them make me feel less confident or make me doubt. Wait, did I earn it? Did I do this? I mean, it's crazy. Doors have been opened for people for all kinds of reasons forever. You might get a door open because your father plays golf with somebody at work, right? You might get a door open because your mother went to that university and therefore you're a legacy. You might get a door open, but nobody ever says, oh, right? Oh, it must be nice that your father did that. They don't say that. Because those things are just connections, right? Those things happen, quote, all the time. Doors open all the time. So we shouldn't let people make us feel less than for whatever reason a door opened for us. It's what you do on the other side of the threshold that counts. Well, I completely agree. And it sounds like you had to really open the doors yourself there in the beginning in in, in the tech industry. I mean, you were the one who were even, you were creating doors <laughs> to be opened. Then no one else is that no one opened those doors before. You know, how do you have that foresight? How do you have that vision 
one of my favorite psychologists, Paul Torrance, you know, calls it falling in love with a future image of yourself. You know, you fell in love with that future image of yourself. And I'm just wondering, well, how? You know, it's interesting. It, part of it is competitive. I would tell people what I want to do. And I would do that so that that also held me accountable to do it. Because the last thing I wanted to do was to show up. And when they say, oh, did you do such and such? And I'd say, oh, no, I didn't. Right. I'm not doing that. I'm, you know, I, if I say I'm going to do something, then I'm going to do it. So I actually used, frankly, other people, you know, peer pressure, that competitive piece to actually help continue to push me forward. And that's one of the reasons why I would share my goals and share what I'm trying to do, because then I had a lot of people that were going to hold me accountable to make sure I actually did it. Who were some of the biggest influences in your life early in your, you know, who really believed in you in the, in the tech industry early on? Oh, gosh. So I'll focus on Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, you know, Ben Horowitz was, it was an early one. Andy Radcliffe came out to the first North Point. North Point was a high-speed DSL company. I was running marketing and sales. And they went through, a, I was there for only a short period of time because the whole market ended up in, imploding and they got bought by AT&T. But Andy Radcliffe was on the board with Benchmark. And he said, Shelly, I want you at LoudCloud. That was another company he was invested in and introduced me over there. And I ultimately did get hired to be chief marketing officer and then ultimately also EVP of sales. So Andy believed in me. And then, you know, Bill Campbell was another one. And he was he was huge. And I mean, I've, I've just been really fortunate. You know, I could I could kind of go on from there. I ended up with a, a lot of people that ended up believing me, believing in me and being supporters. This whole area of you strategized for your success. I mean. That's a lot of thought you, you put into this <laughs> whole week and my head's dizzying. I'm like, wow, you devised your plan. You, you prepared for the opportunity to appear. You learned the ropes. How did you foster that self-determination? That's a, that's a big theme of that whole section of your book is that, uh, in, as you, you know, there's self-determination theory in, in, in my field of positive psychology. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because it wasn't until I was writing the book that I actually did the the research to understand that that's what it was, self-determination, right? And so what I learned was there are basically three things that are key for developing it. So one is autonomy, right? It's just feeling that you actually have ownership over, over yourself, over your actions, right? All of that. And that was definitely fostered at home, right? That was that whole life isn't fair, so what are you going to do about it, right? Peace. And the second piece that comes to that is competence which means being able to actually achieve something. It's mastery, right? Showing that you have skills. I was a good student and I knew that if I studied something or worked on it, I could, you know, I could learn anything. So I had that. The piece that took me longer to actually create was the relatedness piece. And that's the one that was- Belonging. Yep, feeling part of a group. And I, I never did. I always felt like this outsider. And it really wasn't until I got to college that I was able to begin to develop that and then continued, right? Once I felt it, I'm like, ah, this is what this is. And this, this I want. And then I was more conscious about really trying to find my people, if you will. So yeah, all three are really needed to be able to do that and do it consistently. Because I, I made a lot of decisions that people didn't think I should make. So it wasn't, it wasn't always easy. Okay. So how did you build your reputation then? I mean, again, I, the word chutzpah keeps coming up when I think of you. How did you, with all people saying that, you're like, you know, but I want to, I have this vision in my head and I want to build that reputation. What are some concrete things, you know, aspiring people in the industry maybe have to overcome hurdles listening to this podcast? You know, they, they want to build this reputation. Do you, do you have sort of advice for them for your own personal experience? Sure. I mean, everybody builds a reputation differently. I will tell you what's helped me build my reputation is I am someone that tries to help and support others. And honestly, and it wasn't even one of those situations where I shrewdly said, oh, if I do this, I'll develop a good reputation, right? It was much more of, I tried to treat people like I wanted to be treated because I knew what it was like not to be. And therefore, I, I've always tried to be helpful, to be supportive. I try to make commitments and keep them. So if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. So I think the, the combination of, of those two things, I become somebody that people can count on. 
you get to that stage where you have the crystal clear clarity and you're trying to build your reputation. You, you're, you're kind of the naysayers. You're kind of like, you know what? I'm not going to listen to you anymore. What is this idea of no second thoughts? Wow. What, how does one get to that point? You know, at the end of the day, nobody knows you better than you know you. Unfortunately, I, no, I'm, joking, I'm, joking, I'm joking. I know too much about myself. I'm sorry. You caught me in a cheeky mood today. No, it's, it's, all, it's all good. You know, so as a result, listen to what people have to say for sure and analyze it and think through it. But at the end of the day, you have to trust your decisions because nobody knows you as well as you know you. And that's, that's really what it came, comes down to. So this whole notion of, you know, no second thoughts and make, it's like make the decision, move forward. And if it turns out to be the wrong decision, then fine, you'll pivot or you'll make a change. But don't waste energy just thinking, oh my gosh, should I really be doing this? Should I not be doing this? Should we I mean, just, it's much more important just to move forward and shift than to get stuck. I'd like to take a little break to talk about one of our sponsors, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of fascinating classes for creative and curious people like the listeners of the Psychology Podcast. At a time when so many important conversations are happening in the world, you too can have a voice and contribute by exploring classes to boost your creativity for social good. The platform also allows you to introduce yourself to a community of millions of people. Personally, I really enjoyed the class called Productivity Masterclass, Principles and Tools to Boost Your Productivity. It's taught by Ali Abdal, a self-proclaimed productivity nerd who is a doctor and generally really productive guy. Ali shares some really valuable lessons he has learned on how to boost your productivity. Something I really liked about his course is that he talks about the power of productive downtime as well as the power of productive procrastination. He even talks about the importance of having fun. As Ali notes, what is the point of productivity if we aren't having fun? I find this to be an often overlooked topic. I find this to be an often overlooked topic in discussions of productivity. I've also really been enjoying classes in the creative writing category. For instance, Susan Orlean's course called Creative Nonfiction, Write Truth with Style is fantastic and helped me a lot with how to properly organize my notes. I'm confident that the courses on Skillshare are really valuable right now. I'm confident that the courses on Skillshare are really valuable right now, especially when we are spending so much time at home and it's so easy to get overwhelmed with so many tasks. Another nice thing about Skillshare is that it has classes that fit your schedule and skill level, and it's incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. In fact, we have a special offer today just for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. Explore your creativity and get two free months of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash psychology. That's two whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get started and join today by heading to Skillshare.com slash psychology. That's two free months of unlimited access to thousands of classes at Skillshare.com slash psychology. You move forward with your values. You know, you talk about how living your values and just unapologetically ambitious. There's still a humility there in the sense humility means knowing your strengths. You, you, you do say embrace your limits, but, but that's an interesting phrasing, right? Like embrace your limits. Wait, what does that mean? So can you tell people like what that juxtaposition means? Yeah, absolutely. So what I mean by embrace your limits is there are going to be some things. I mean, when I was a kid, I actually thought I wanted to I be mean, a kid little, not in high school, but I thought I wanted to be a pilot, right? But then it turns out pilots at the time had to have really good eyesight and I had terrible eyesight. So you know what? That's not happening. I, right. So I get to spend a ton of time ruminating and being upset and the whole bit, but bottom line, it's not happening. So, you know, embrace the limits. Okay. That's the limit. Move on, find something else in terms of that you can, that you can do or that you can go after. The other is don't continually beat yourself up for your limits. Right. I mean, so the whole embrace your limits are, I used to tell my kids all the time, everybody's a package. Everybody's a package. I'm a package, daddy's a package, everybody's a package, which means 
There are going to be wonderful things about us. And there are going to be things that you wish didn't come with the package. But you know what? You don't get to pick what's inside the package. You just get the overall package. So this embrace your limits thing is really your, your package. So if that's your limit, hey, that's, that's your limit. That's why I say focus on your strengths. You're a positive psychologist over there. You know, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I mean, there's so much of what you're saying is, is so in line with the latest research in my field. So oh, um, that's so cool. I, I'm a, I don't know if you knew, I'm a humanistic positive psychologist. So good stuff. Tell people what you want. Is this the importance of, of asserting yourself and kind of not being ashamed, kind of unapologetically asserting your needs? You know, telling people what you want is not quite. And actually, let me, before I answer that, let me talk about the title for a minute. Can I talk about the title? I would hope you would. Wonderful. So the unapologetically ambitious. Let me, let me define these words as I see them right first. Because when I say unapologetically ambitious, I'm not telling people to go out there and get in everybody's face, right? Unapologetically ambitious. I'm going to be CEO. Get behind me, right? All full, full steam ahead. That's not necessarily what I mean. What I mean is it is absolutely fine to be ambitious. And by the way, ambitious, it doesn't mean you have to want to be CEO. It doesn't mean you have to want to be a pilot or whatever. I mean, ambitious just means there are things that you want to accomplish. They can be things at home. They can be things at church. They can be things in the community. They can be things at work. It doesn't matter. But do you have things that you actually want to accomplish and do? And if you do, then you're ambitious because you're driving to have an impact, to make something happen. The unapologetically piece is you don't have to apologize for it. It is okay. It is absolutely okay to be ambitious. It's okay to want to strive and to do things. But too many people are told they're ambitious and it's not meant as a compliment. And that's ridiculous. Right. When you told people you wanted to be a CEO and people were like, nah, I don't think you should do that. That's crazy. I'm all about if someone has an ambition, let's help them get there. It seems so absurd. It is. It is. You would, you would never raise your child. You would never say, oh, go work hard, get good grades, you know, put in the extra effort, da, 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 da. but oh, oh, don't be too ambitious. We never do that, but we do that to people all the time. So anyway, so that's the, so the unapologetically ambitious, you know, that's what it is. Yes, be ambitious. You don't have to apologize for it. Just go after it. This whole notion of tell people what you want um, is really meant to unleash the fact that there are a lot of people in this world that actually are very happy to help others. But you can't get help for what you want to do if people don't know what you want to do. So tell people what you want and give them a chance to actually help you, to contribute. You know, so many people wish and hope, right? Oh, I hope I get that opportunity or I hope they pick me or I hope this. Well, people can't read your mind. And then when they don't, you get upset but they didn't know you wanted it. And maybe the other person, they knew that they wanted it. So you have to, you have to put it out there. You know, we, we can't always predict where, where life is going to go, right? And you try to make the right choice at the right time when you try not to live your life with regrets, right? But, you know, how does staying connected relate to this resiliency aspect? You know, stay, staying connected and connected with people, I think it's been really important to me. So I, I even refer, you know, my network, um, my close network, I refer to as my, my village. They are what keeps me propped up. You know, they are what helps me be able to do the things that, that I do. And I count on them. So this whole connectedness piece is, uh, is a critical part of my personal success. You know, you're much less likely to be able to form new supportive connections in the industry. No, that's true. But I actually see, I see it a little differently too, though, Scott, in that, let me tell you how I define a network. I define a network as comprising people who will do, who will do you a favor when it is not convenient. All right. A lot of people who it's easy, you know, sure, I can help. I can do that. Right. No, no skin off my back, no time, no effort, whatever. When it's time, when it's effort, the people who are willing to do that that's a real network. That is my village. And that is more than just reputation. Those, those are real relationships where both parties feel they are getting value, right, from that relationship. And those take 
you know, time, effort, focus, all, all of it. Absolutely. In terms of develop. So, you know, to me, a network has never been how many people I have in my contact list. It has been all about, you know, the people that I feel out there that actually care about me. This idea of you deserve it. Well, you know, there's an, there's a kind of like a theme just as I'm reading your whole book. And I'm like, you do a really good job not going into the territory of narcissism, but yet still maintain the uh, importance of being confident and having ambition. It's a very unique space, this book that you wrote, because you, you often see these kinds of books, sometimes they veer too much into like one direction or the other. Sometimes they'll veer very much in the narcissistic direction of like, you're the greatest, you know, like it's not you deserve it, but you're entitled to it. And there's a there's a subtle difference there, and I think you 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 told that line very well. So can you a little bit can you talk a little bit about that chapter? You deserve it. Yes, you know, at, at the end of the day, <clears throat> your your hard work, your focus, right? All that all that you do when good things happen, when a promotion opportunity comes by comes your way, right? Or a door opens for you, or you're invited into the room, whatever it is, you deserve for that to happen. Don't be apologizing or excusing yourself or, or making yourself small, right? When those things happen, you wouldn't be invited in in the first place if they didn't think that you belong there. So remember that. And if you forget and you're feeling like, oh my God, I don't think I should either take this opportunity or maybe I shouldn't join this group or I shouldn't, da 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 da, da go find your cheerleaders. <laughs> That's when you need your cheerleaders who are reminding you, yes, you do. Yes, you can. You know, I mean, don't don't let those things stop you from doing things. And so the whole you deserve it piece is it's it's counter to it's counter to a lot of other messages that come to people, especially people who have been disenfranchised in one way or the other, which is just, you know, you should be you should be happy that you're that you're here. You know what I mean? You should you should feel like you are you're lucky or fortunate like it's like somebody's given you a, a gift and that's not right. You're absolutely right, and and I'm glad that, I'm glad that you framed it in that sort of way. Is uh, like you know what I mean? How some of this stuff can veer into this territory where you're not grounded in reality anymore, you know, and you just think that but you're all about like working for it, you know, you're about and owning it and having that that autonomy. So I can I, I really get on board with with your vision of humanity. So improving your odds, you say find the current. What's the current? What is this you're talking about? Yeah, it's, it's the current to power. You know, it's the path to power. When, uh, when I joined IBM, my, you know, my original goal was I want to be CEO and I picked tech. And so I picked IBM, which was like the Apple or Google of its day and said, great, I'll go be CEO of IBM. So I did the research and every single CEO started out in sales. And I said, all right, then that must be the path. So I started as a salesperson. And it wasn't that I was in love with selling. As a matter of fact, my friends thought I was crazy, right? Another reason, another thing, Shelly, you're going to what? You're coming out of Wharton and you're going to sell computers? Nobody does that, right? They're all going off to be investment bankers, P&G product managers, international analysts, I mean, all kinds of things. And I picked sales because that was the current. And I followed the current. It's like, okay, so what's the role? What's the job? I worked my way all the way to Japan, international assignment, because every single direct report to the CEO that ran a, a line business had international experience. I mean, I, if, you, if you find the path to power, you know, which is basically what is the career path that others took in front of you and learn from that, then I just always felt that if that's the path that others took, then that's a well-worn path. So that if I, it's like being on a current, if I work hard, I also get the propulsion of my own work, but then also the propulsion of the current itself, because I'm in the right place. So that's what I mean by find the current, the path to power. Yeah, a good, a good kind of power, not, not the kind of power that you have control over others, but where you make an impact on the world in a positive way. Yeah, yeah, it's very clear. It's very clear. That's the, the kind of power that... Because we, we see in these days some other kinds of power. Okay, so a lot of this is, just to wrap this all up, and this is my last sort of question, you know, a lot of this thread running through your book is really about planning, right? It's like a life planning 101 kind of, kind of book and really showed me the value of 
Yeah, especially with uh, some certain domains in my life, you know, really sitting down and thinking it through and, and doing whatever you can to improve the odds because that's that's all we can do, you know, and yeah, I love your, your, your whole spirit of this, of acknowledging it, certain things are the way they are, you know, but there are certain things I can do to uh, to improve the odds and nevertheless, even even with all these societal impediments in my way. So thanks so much for coming on the show today, Shelly, and inspiring so many people. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. In fact, many of these episodes are in video format on YouTube, so you'll definitely want to check out that channel. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.